Hey, welcome back to 26 Minutes With, um, the show again for uh, those who are leading, making an impact and creating positive change, not only on the planet, but just, just locally in your own community and life with those that they reach. And our guest today is uh, Chris Saunders. We're talking about his uh, his Nerdpreneur podcast and, and a few other things too. So this is the mm -hmm. deeper dive segment where we go a little bit deeper um, with uh, Chris. So beforehand, we were talking about, you know, don't be afraid to fail and, 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 and try new things. And then we talked to you about, you know, I asked you, this, what the question that I asked you is, where did you get all this, these passions and talents? How did they come together? And you mentioned, you know, growing up and the influence of your parents, but also studying theater at school. And we were talking mm -hmm. um, just offline just now about, you know, improv, you know, that I, I mentioned I'd studied improv too. And you, you brought up something really important in terms of don't, you know, I was taught, don't try and be funny, just be like, be in the moment, listen. Do you want to expand on that? Cause you had some yeah. insights to share. Yeah, well, you know, the thing that I, when we were in theater school, I remember the, one of the first things that they would have us do is a improv, but it wasn't like what you see on whose line it is, is it anyway, it's not like trying to be funny, it was actually, you know, this is the scenario. Um, it's a fairly serious scenario. Usually it has to do with, you know, uh, this is your uh, girlfriend and she you have and she, you know she has something she's not telling you and you need to find a way to address that in the room and that's the situation go and what was what the or it could be like we had one where it was called um old smells this one is actually what really sticks out to me when i think back and the reason they call Call it old smells is because the the situation was you know you're from you're almost a memory from the past you're a person from this person's past and you're coming back in to their life at that moment and create a scenario around that and I remember my friend uh, and I were were doing this scenario where I had gone to jail uh, for a while based on something that we had both kind of done around stealing a stereo and the. The whole thing was, you know, when you get into this room again, you kind of you 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 have these old smells, you remember them, um, you know, and you're, it brings you back to that place. So, you know, when we go through, they had set up a little scenario, and we're we're looking, and it's like, oh wow, this this is kind of like the old place. I just got out of jail, and then I'm connecting with him, and he's a little different, but I'm still that same kind of guy, and and the energy that I have in that. And so, what happens is in those moments where you're not trying to be funny, you're just trying to be real, you're trying to be authentic, you really have to listen to what your partner is saying to you and then react to that. You know, so much of acting is reacting. And in order to properly act, you have to listen. And if you're sitting there trying to think of what's the next thing I'm going to say while the other person's talking, you lose the whole thread and you lose the audience. But when you really sit there and listen and remain authentic to the scene, to what's happening and what someone is doing or saying or acting towards you, that's where the magic happens. And that's where I'll tell you, we had some very, very funny things come out of that scene. I remember, you know, noticing the stereo that had been stolen in the place and like reacting to it in that moment and then being like, oh, cool, that's awesome. And then it kind of comes to a climax where he's telling me, you know, dude, I'm not the same guy. You can't stay here, you know? And my first reaction, because I was really listening and that moment really hit me was I'm taken to stereo. I was like, that was my, 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 my character's moment was like, I I'm taking the thing I stole because it's mine. Right. But that authenticity in that moment wasn't something I could have planned for. It wasn't something I could have set up or written. It was something that came out of the moment and the entire class erupts in laughter. You get that authentic, real connection because they felt that that was the real thing for me in that moment. And that's where the audience uh, reacted in laughter with it. So, you know, listen, that's that's a, that's a really big tip there. And it's a big tip, not only for that field, but also, you know, being in business, listening to your customer. You know, you, mm -hmm. you, you work with Jeff Walker mm -hmm. uh, on, on the launch uh, product launch formula. You know, yeah. that's really getting to know your customer first and know yeah. the, the niche and know what, what, what they want and, and then offering, 
a, a tailor-made sort of solution for them. You know? Yeah, a great entrepreneur. Well, I learned a lot of this in sales because so many people, I, I remember there was a, uh, there was a, a great uh, salesperson in our company named John Berghoff, and he's the one who taught this, but he said, people, people don't buy because they understand. They buy because they feel understood. Yes. And that was a huge shift in the way that I, 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 I sold and the ability for me to instead tell you all about this. Let me tell you all the features, tell you all the benefits, tell you how much it's worth, how great it is. And here's the price. Do you want to buy it? Like all of that was sort of that, that's not, that's not, cool selling. Yeah. Like it didn't really work the way that I wanted it to. And so in actuality, when I talked less, asked more questions, you know, and really listened so that I could help that person find the right thing for them, as opposed to telling them what they should buy or what it is. I could make recommendations based on what they were saying. Then they felt understood. You know, one of the things I would say, was we, we would always present, some people would only present one set, the biggest set and say, this is the best set because they're trying to sell the biggest thing. And what I would always do was I'd say, there are really three sets of knives that uh, work for every for for everybody. You know, mm. there's this really big one for people who love cooking. They do it all the time. They want to entertain and they want the biggest and best thing. And that's awesome if that's you. Now, we also have this one, which is more for people who just, you know, cooking sometimes is fun. Sometimes it's a chore. And you just got to basically get it done sometimes. And sometimes you're going to entertain, but you're not looking for, you know, the biggest and brightest all the time. But then there's this one, which is our smaller set, but it's really for people who just don't want to get in and out of the kitchen as quick as possible. You know, this is not their passion. This is just very practical. Now it would be a big set, a very big set, I should say, a big set, and then a slightly less big set, right? But by saying that, I would then say, you know, based on what you've told me and what I've seen from, you know, going through this, I think this set would be the best set for you. Would you agree with that? And then they and then they know I'm looking out for them. I actually would even say, I don't think this really big set is good for you based on what you told me. It's just too many things. You probably will be like, ah, this won't work. And they're like, yeah, that's totally me. I'm not going to, never going to use that many knives. Great. What about this one? And then they would say, yes, that one, that's way more. Now they're telling me I want to buy this set so then I can go into detail on it and really help them um, feel understood and then, you know, serve them at the highest level there. So listening and making them feel understood was a big, big tip in selling and sales. Yeah. Uh, all amazing advice. So those watching, listening, hope you're taking notes. <laughs> so these are good, uh, uh, good notes to take. We're going to, I want to go back to Nurpreneur, but before I do, I'd be remiss. Um, how did the, you're a young guy, how did the relationship and, and what was it, you know, that the, the, the Jeff Walker people saw him? Because, mm -hmm. you know, he's in the league of, you know, he mentioned, you know, Tony Robbins and, uh, if, you know, some of yeah. the games. How did, how did you connect with, with him? What, 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 That's a great story, actually. I, I, I will tell you, I, you know, I tell people this even in Jeff's company because uh, mm -hmm. they, they often wonder like, how did you get into this company? Yeah. Right. Cause um, I mean, Jeff is uh, is somebody who's been around a long time in the digital marketing space. And so if you're not sure who he is, um, if you're anywhere in digital marketing and you you talk to, say, Russell Brunson or people like Tony Robbins or some of those big names, everybody who's in the industry knows Jeff and credits Jeff for really inventing modern day digital marketing. He's kind of like, you know, what they call the OG of digital marketing. And I uh, I love that because, you know, he really does sell a product that one works. He's a very humble guy. He's not like out there. They're trying. He's not like he's not a Grant Cardone. I don't know why I keep you know shitting on Grant Cardone. I don't know if I can swear in here, but not. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I can't. I if, I don't know. I don't know why I keep doing that with Grant Cardone. I like the guy, but he's very much a different personality to someone like Jeff. I really liked the way Jeff was as far as his personality. So the way I found him, okay. I'll just say that he's a very humble guy. It's not about the money for him. He's really about about the impact that his people and one of his messages. What is to um, change the world through entrepreneur heroes. Okay. So it's not about like, let's make everybody rich. <laughs> let's 
And no, change the world positively, bring positive things to the world through entrepreneurship and, uh, you know, treating those, treating yourself like a hero that can actually do something and serve a really important segment of the community. So that's why, that's one of the reasons that I really align with him is that I just feel like, you know, if it's not about the money, it's about following your passion, about doing it. It all makes sense. And that kind of aligns with Nerdpreneur. But how did I find Jeff? Because <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, I was in sales, like I said, for 13 plus years, I worked with uh, Cutco and I was a manager. So I was doing a lot of things, a straight commission for 13 years. That was uh, that was what I was on. And you have ups and downs and seasons in that kind of business, you sure. know? And so, you know, I uh, I was always about personal growth. I'm always looking for be bigger and better things and how to do my job better. How could I bring more value to the people that I'm serving, which were my sales reps and the, and the, the, the company there. So um, I listened to the Tim Ferriss podcast, which is uh, when it first came out, he was just interviewing a bunch of different people. Um, and one of those people, I think it might've been his like eighth or ninth or 10th episode, something like that was Susan Garrett. Now, Susan Garrett is the probably number one, I want to say best dog agility trainer in the world. I don't own a dog. I don't know why I was listening to this episode, but I did. And I always say, if I'm listening to something, there's probably something in dog training I can use. Let me see. And the thing that came out of it was they were talking about launching her courses online. And she said, oh, well, I, I read the book Launch and I from Jeff Walker. And it was awesome. And then Tim Ferriss perks up and it says, oh, that book. Yeah, that's the best book ever written on launching. And I'm like, well, the best book ever written on launching. That sounds pretty cool. Uh, I could probably use launching to help me promote my conferences or some of these sales events that I'm doing. Let me just order that on Amazon. So I ordered it and I read the book. And of course, if you're writing a book, one of the objectives is to get people on your list. So it's a lead magnet for your list. So I got into the list on there and I, uh, and I said, Hey, I'll, uh, I'll uh, listen to his emails. And I want you to see, like, I don't really read a lot of emails. Jeff is not like necessarily the person that resonates with me. He's a little bit older and that's fine. I respected a lot of what his wisdom was, but I didn't watch a lot of his videos. I probably never even clicked on any of his emails. And I just was on his list for months and months, maybe even a year or two. And on a bad day where I was like struggling a little bit financially, struggling a little bit with just the difficulty of my, of my, of my situation at home. I was, uh, you know, living with a girl I wasn't super excited about at that time. And I was a little stuck. I remember thinking to myself, do I want to keep going down this path with the job that I'm in? And in my inbox, I want to say that day or that night was an email from Jeff that said, we're looking for people. And it was for some admin thing. It was before Launch Club was even a thing. But I, I noticed in their copy, the sales copy, they were they said, oh, we're looking for superstars. And I had just read a book called The Ultimate Sales Machine by, oh, by Chet Holmes. Sure. Yeah, Chet Holmes, one of the greatest yeah. uh, sales books ever written. If you yeah. want to read one of the best yeah. sales books, one of the best ones, hands down. I work with Tony Robbins, amazing. But one of his things was all about how to attract superstars. And I thought to myself, I, I might want to be in this company just be based on the fact that they're reading the same thing as I am. And I, and I might be able to fit in with that. So I just sent my resume, not knowing anything about it. And I had never done digital marketing really. I knew how to sell though. So I uh, sent my resume in. they sent back an email the next day saying, Hey, everybody, uh, not everybody, but they said, Hey, you stood out from the applications. I learned later that they basically sent this to everybody. Okay. Over, over 300 people got this wow. message saying, Hey, you should, uh, you should apply, but you need to do this questionnaire and you need to do a three minute YouTube video telling us why you would be a great fit for our company. Now that was a game changer for me because I had looked at other jobs and applied and I hated, hated, hated applying for jobs, like going through all the resume stuff. And then they, you can send your resume, but then they also have you fill in a form and then you're like trying and in your hours trying to figure out more about the company to answer these questions properly. And I was just like, so much easier if I just do a video. That's really cool. And then I also thought to myself, let's go look at the competition because they wanted us to post it on YouTube under the thing, go get him, Jeff Walker. And so I could just Google that or go to YouTube and put in, go get him, Jeff Walker. And I would find all these videos from people who had posted them. And you know what? It gave me a level of confidence applying because as much as a lot of these people may have had some great knowledge or skill sets in digital marketing, not one of them knew how to sell themselves and really make an impactful video. 
you know, some people were just holding up their phone and doing all this sort of thing. And some people were like, you know, speaking in front of a, a camera, but their place wasn't set up nicely. Like there, there was just so many red flags. I've been in recruiting for, for ages. So I'm like, there's just so many flags in all of these videos that I'm like, I don't want to even, I, I would never hire any of these people. So I thought maybe I could stand out. So I made a three minute video, but the three minute video incorporated a minute and a half of me just sort of you know, humbly trying to be humble about like, I'm pretty good at this. I'm pretty good at that. I could tell you all these things about what I've done with my company here, there, and there, but that won't really be as much of an impact as if I just, you know, have the people I've worked with tell you. And so then it cuts and I have like seven or eight people that I had worked with who were great people, but some of them had just recently left the company, some of them that, and they actually all were willing to record like, you know, a couple minutes on why I was a great person to hire. And they did an awesome job. I cut it all together with some music and then three minutes in done, sent it off to them. And I remember they actually, uh, like what I learned later was half the people never even did that assignment. So immediately, you know, they're not even executors or didn't really want this job. Of the hundred and some odd people, I rose to the top really quickly because it was a produced thing. It was a project that I put some effort and time into. So like, wow, this guy's got something. And um, they said to me, you know, let's do an interview. So I got an interview with some of the key people. They said I was going to talk to Jeff. And then it got to the point where they were like, you know what? We like you. We really think you're great. However, we're not ready for you. We don't even know if we're going to sell this program, which was called Launch Club. They were just creating it. So I said, so they said, can we keep you on uh, our list for later? And I'm like, sure, sure, whatever, I guess so. And I was a little disappointed, but I went back to my knife selling job. I, I moved to Vancouver. I got out of that whole bad situation I was in. I, you know, did a bunch of work in Vancouver to build the office up. I was in the same company. And a year and a half later, I get, and I changed my number, changed my email. I was, just, I forgot all about it in some ways, you know, a year and a half later, I got a message on LinkedIn from the person who was our hiring, who was the hiring manager. And uh, she said, are you still looking for something? We might have something for you now. And that was where I said, okay, let me, uh, let me see what you got. And that's how I got into Jeff's world. It was, uh, it was crazy. And I also just this week talked with Jeff about that situation. And he had said to me, you know, I only looked at maybe two or three people and there was just something that I noticed when I was looking through you and your YouTube content. Cause well, here's what was interesting. Cause I was on my YouTube. He, they probably sent my video, right? And my video rose to the top, but I wasn't the only video that I had put out on my YouTube channel. I had also done a rap song that was a parody of uh, Notorious B.I.G.'s The Ten Crack Commandments, but I had done them as The Ten Cutco Commandments. And it was all about selling knives. And he looked at that, and to Jeff, that stood out. And he said, there's something about this guy. He's got something. Let's get him in an interview. <laughs> and it's weird to look back on that and say how much different my life, the, these little threads that somehow got me, you know, from the Tim Ferriss podcast to the, you know, being in a disgruntled mood on the day they sent that hiring email to, you know, them remembering me a year and a half later and just checking my, my LinkedIn messages that day to Jeff watching my video that they were, and the, and the, and that I had put that up and kept it up there forever. This, this rap video that I decided to make and all of those things wound up getting me into Jeff's world where now I have this wonderful career and I get to be around amazing and awesome entrepreneurs from all over the world and then have an impact on changing the world positively. I love it. And how long have you been with Jeff? Like when did that grow? That I started with him. Uh, I've probably been in, I'm probably in my seventh year with him right oh, now. Oh, wow. So yeah. a while. Yeah. Yeah. Around 2016 is when I jumped in. Yeah. Right at the beginning of 2016, I believe. How did they handle the uh, pandemic? Because that was a real game changer. It really was. You know, I mean, a couple of things. One of the things when it first hit, you know what they, I, I'm the guy on the team that does any of the phone calls. So if you're phone calling, I'm probably the guy on the phone uh, with you just because nobody else likes to talk on the phone and I don't like it, but I can do it a lot better than most people because I phone people over and over and over in my old job. So I'm pretty comfortable. 
Uh, one of the things, and I think this is really speaks to who Jeff is, is he said, we're just going to give you a list of people who are kind of our owners and people, and we want you to call them just to check in on them and see like, what are people feeling? What are they thinking about? We want that feedback. We really do, because we're not quite sure what we should be doing right now as a company and whether it makes sense for us to launch. Does it make sense for us to, you know, give something away for, for, for some sort of value and like, what, what is it? And so uh, again, instead of diving in, assuming he knows. Jeff is willing to listen. And so he he sent me on a mission to call. I must have called, you know, uh, a not insignificant, a, a couple hundred people probably I called over a week or so of just like interacting. And I got some great feedback. And one, it was a great kind of level 10 experience where they're like, wow, this is really nice that this person that I subscribed to on an email list and maybe I'm part of his product launch formula. It's uh, they were willing to, to reach out and just, no, I'm not selling anything. I just wanted to kind of check in. Like, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Like, what's going on? How are things? And I bring all that information back to the team so that Jeff can craft a, a, a high value driven um, launch where, you know, we always say, you know, if you're going to join up for our, our, our program, um, that is great. But if you're not, come to our masterclass or what we called the Silverton at that time masterclass, where Jeff, his whole objective is I'm going to give away the absolute best stuff I can for free. It is the best hands down launch training of how to build an online business without being inside my program. OK, so, of course, I'm still going to do that. But, and you know, we also made it available for people to jump into the program if they wanted to at that point. But we had a great launch right at that moment. And we also extended our payment options at that moment too, so that people who were in a rougher or harder situation, or maybe they really needed this, but they couldn't quite afford to pay the first payment, they could get in and start building their, their list and that sort of thing. And again, so we reacted that way in a way of like, let's be leaders. Let's figure out a way to do a live launch where we provide massive value and yes, give people an opportunity, but a better opportunity with an extended payment plan to take this to a new level. And really they, uh, they reacted, it, people reacted great to it. Our company was really, uh, really, you know, we, we pivoted very, very well and, uh, it wound up, uh, wound up being a great year for us too. Um, yeah. cause I think a lot of people wound up coming into our, into our world and starting to find that they could build their own business online rather than have to be uh, beholden to the mandates that were being put down upon other people. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. And I, I, I like what, the strategy was go connect with people. You know, I teach market research and, you know, one of your, your, your you have to connect with your audience and mm -hmm. find out where they're at, what they want, you know, and if it's bad news, don't, don't freak out. Good. You know, get the bad news and just make that adjustment, you know, the right way. I like what you also said too, prior to that question, where, you know, when we we're talking about how you came to 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 work with Jeff Walker and the, you know, the the launch uh, team, and you said it was like a perfect sort of all your experiences came to play. So that means you know how you were raised by your parents in terms of you know yeah go do things and try new things and be open. Um, don't just read, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, not that th that's really important. Read too. <laughs> yeah. For yeah. Sure. But do other things, and then yeah. you know you're schooling with the uh, theater and 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 the improv work and the and the creativity, and then your mm -hmm. sales career in, with Cutco knives and 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 for those that don't know, um, Hal Elrod, wonderful human being, like survived cancer and a horrific uh, car accident, uh, wrote the book Miracle Morning, and 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 also um the new version of it uh, which i have in my other room and i'd go get it yeah um, it's 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 a, a new version of the miracle morning but it's really about having morning rituals yeah well, i like how you're bringing the whole of you to the table mm -hmm. um and, and i really give you credit for that chris in terms of then you know how can nerdpreneurs bring their whole selves to the table um mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about it already. Um, if you were to coach a, a nerdpreneur who has that, or or just an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur who has that off the wall idea like dice, or and they're wavering on launching, what would your advice be? My biggest advice for people when they 
when they are ready to kind of step into, um, I think, a bigger world. You know, I, I just uh, let me let me just read a quote. I want to make sure I get it right, but and I just you, you, I just heard it, okay. and it it's really great. Like, you know, little things become big things in a small world. Yes. And I've had to think about that one for a, for a while because it just keeps coming up for me and keeps resonating. Um, it's from a guy named Michael Maidens. I believe he came up with it. Um, someone that uh, that I've I've met through uh, through Jeff and some of the the businesses that I work with. But you know, when you're step when you're on the edge right now, and you might be worried, like, well, can I do this? Should I do this? You know, you should dive in, and you know, however you do those those. Like get into a bigger world, you know, otherwise some of these little things are are going to become really big things to you. <laughs> and so stepping out of your comfort zone is the way a lot of people like to put it and being willing to do that, you know, because that's where the magic happens. We've probably all seen that graphic where there's that circle or comfort zone. And then yeah. out here is the magic. You've got to be willing to step outside of the comfort zone. And so that might be, and I'll tell you as you know, entrepreneur, I heard this a lot. I was very nervous about putting out my first piece of content. I was very nervous about asking for money for what I was doing. And once they do step out into that, that, that next level, um, that's where the magic happens. That's where you can shift. That's where you can pivot. You're stepping in, into a bigger world. Be willing to make that jump. Be willing to make that step because when you get there, then you can actually look back and and and, and all those little, those those big things that were part of that small world. They're not as big anymore, and they aren't going to be as big of a, a, a deal. Um, you know, I always say that if your content sucks, the algorithm protects you. You, no one's going to see it. <laughs> so there's not really much risk of just putting out content. And you know what? If it sucks, you're going to get better. But at least that milestone of putting it out there, the more you do it, the more you be, do, uh, you actually post out there and the faster you're going to get better at doing it and the more confident you're going to be about it. I look back at my earliest content. It's my worst content. The first is the worst. Same with launching. Your first launch is your worst launch. But by going through it, you learn a lot about your market. You learn a lot about you. You also learn a lot about your offer. And all of that information is so valuable that when you come back to do it again, you'll be able to do it at a much higher percentage of, say, uh, success. And you'll steadily get better and better and better, you know? Yeah. And 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 then also, too, you'll, you'll get used to failing, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and and take that worry and fear out of failing and, and look at it as a learning opportunity. And it's, yeah. it's, it's going to stretch you because failing is not the most comfortable when you're, when things are going well, you're comfortable, you're in, you're in that comfort zone when it's going well, but mm -hmm. when you're not succeeding, maybe the way you want, you're more open to learning, trying new things, making adjustments in terms of these kind of nerdpreneur businesses being viable financially you 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 focused on a few uh in the 26 minutes version mm -hmm. um can they do you feel it moving forward can they attract venture capital or investment or are they flying too under the radar um it it really is um uh, you know how profitable can you be like one of the people we actually interviewed um, took a very different route than this. And we call him a nerdpreneur, but uh, he is a professional dungeon master or game master. And uh, his name is Devin. He actually runs a, a website called startplaying.games. And his entire model was he he got a big Bloomberg article and he talks about, we actually talk about how he landed that. We, we talk about from there, how he started to get investors and started to go to very various venture capital uh, firms looking for investment because he was looking to create an entire website where people could connect game masters with players so that people could actually start becoming what they call professional game masters playing tabletop role-playing games of all different sorts. So the answer is yes. I do believe that that is a model for some people, especially if you have a viable business where there's a clear uh, market. And a, again, like going into those things, they're going to be looking for your, uh, you know, you to have your numbers right. You have to have offers that people are willing to buy. You have to have a growth opportunity. So, but, but again, 
right now, there's so many people wanting what nerdpreneurs have. Mm -hmm. There's so many people that want to figure out how do I become a full-time game master? How do I get to do that and make money? Because I don't want to work in my you know corporate job anymore. Or I don't want to work in many people who are doing this or young people who are stuck in like service jobs that they yeah, just don't want to really. do anymore. Yeah. yeah. Like, like, like they, they don't, it's not, they don't want to be restaurant people yeah. anymore. They don't want to be in retail anymore. They don't want to have to, you know, do that. And many people also with the advent of AI have huge opportunities right now to be able to create their own business. Now there are tools and strategies and, and techniques that we unearth on Nerdpreneur that will help you get there faster. And that's what we're looking to do is try and teach and inspire people to get to that level faster and also to believe that they can do it. You know, because if I if you listen to some of these episodes, you'll find out that many of them were not much different than any of you when they started. They were just a nerd with some passion and a willingness to try. And you know what? They became business people. They learned through doing and through asking questions, being willing to fail and put themselves out there, but that failure didn't last. See, that first step is only the first step. And it's the first that gets you out there. But then once you continue to walk, continue to move forward, continue to climb the hill, eventually you're going to get to the summit. And that's where nerdpreneur success entrepreneurship can live and maybe that is for getting investors in you you know it might be but you got to build it first and uh that is a route to go we have had people on our podcast that have taken that route is it a growth field do you feel 100 percent. i i actually believe that we're we're a little ahead of the curve in terms of branding it i think that nerdpreneur will be something that will become commonplace in uh in our uh vernacular in the future you know what are you i'm a nerdpreneur you know uh, what does that mean? Well, I pursue my passion to follow and I followed that and I developed this really great business that I love and is also ethical and good. Like I, that's the other thing. I believe the rise of ethical capitalism is not only inevitable, but also really important, really, uh, really important right now. Yeah. We've and, had enough. People, yeah, are people, people don't really realize that, you know, I think, uh, and we, we actually talk about this in one of our next episodes coming out, but there is uh, there's sort of an advent of, of, of an aggression against capitalism. But, um, you know, and, and I can understand why people mm. will say that, because there is there there are reasons there are ways to run businesses that are unethical and there are ways to uh, run businesses where they do not care about the impact. But we as consumers have more power in our choices than ever before. And by choosing the companies that really do align to our values, that's how we're going to uh, fix that situation. By rising up the businesses that are willing to serve and do the right thing and provide for their market, yes, the value that they're looking for, but also not at the expense of other people's lives or damaging it. And if your business can't run that way, then it shouldn't be in business. Yeah. So that there are a lot of companies that I'm finding as we, and by the way, these nerdpreneurs, they have that, almost all of them have that mentality. They're, they're young, they're other under 30, under 40, millennials, Gen Z people who want to create a big, a bigger and better world. They want that. They actually want to change the world. And I love that about the nerdpreneurs that we have coming on our podcast, because they're not interested in just making money. They're interested in having a rich, satisfying life, doing what they love, while also creating a company that thrives and provides value for their people and improves the world. And so there's a real, real impact to whatever your business is going to be. And I encourage people to embrace that they can create that business in an ethical and awesome way while providing amazing value. And that's what this show is also inspiring. Yeah. It's inspiring the next level or the next generation of entrepreneurs to really be leaders and to know what it takes to lead. And yeah. Now, a couple of quick questions before we wrap. This has been great. And by the way, you know, at the beginning or... Uh, before we were, you know, went on air today, uh, we talked about um, a clip that that you you know I could take uh, uh, from what you said, and I think you just said it, so I think I'm going to take that clip. Great, great. Yeah. Um, now, in terms of profiles of nerdpreneurs, 
are men more nerdier than w- the women you've talked to? <laughs> you know, and it, that is funny. Um, you know, I think that again, how do you define nerd? Right? Is is a thing, and and I, it's funny. The word nerd has gone through so many identity changes all the way through, right? Because if I said nerd in the eighties, it wasn't a good thing even in the 90s it wasn't a good thing yeah, but then geek or nerd or like, yeah exactly it's like you're a geek you're a nerd it was somebody who made, yeah you make fun of them there was like that and then you know even revenge of the nerds that whole like movie franchise was, was making fun movie, of nerds yeah. but yeah it was kind of funny right well but but i i don't i and i think that we don't want to just say like oh that's what it is but we're trying to and in a many sense rebrand the word and it's become something much cooler and it used to always be that you know men are nerdy right you know there wasn't really a female nerd and if they were they were like the one weird girl who played D D or video games right i'm on uh you know yeah exactly right and so that's and and again, like Big Bang Theory has sort of also popularized the idea of nerd. Even though I don't particularly em- embrace the image of what it is, yeah. I appreciate that they that they that they did give those people dates. You know what I'm saying? Like they got them out there and got them interacting with women. At least there was some good things there. Um, I will just say though that in answer to your question, between men and women, um, it is really an even spread nowadays. You know, I, I don't see much of a difference in terms of like, well, you know, what what women are into video games? Well, there's a lot of women into playing video games now, okay? There's a lot of women who play Dungeons and Dragons. It's so much more diverse in terms of that than ever before. And the thing that unifies is that people who are passionate and excited about what they're doing they get a chance to find their community and and be able to resonate with a community that that loves them, accepts them, and loves the thing that they uh, are also in. And that's one of the reasons why Dungeons and Dragons, I think, has become such an incredible force in society is because at a base level, it is about acceptance. It's about playing different characters who have all sorts of different features and and benefits and different you know, ways of being, but everything is accepted in that community, you know? And so I think because of that level of acceptance and that richness that that you get around those people, it's so welcoming. You're going to have more women, more men, more they, more them all the way through. And you're going to have anybody coming into these things. You don't really have to be a guy to be a nerdpreneur. You just have to be passionate. You just have to have a will and excitement and, and, and an ambition to make something out of what your passion is and serve your people. And that's open for everybody. Yeah. Well, a couple more questions. Is there a marketing marketing formula? You, you, I saw the interview with uh, Melagi, the uh, harpist. Melagi, yeah. Melagi, sorry. And she got into to this, uh, you know, sort of like not by accident, but you know, she she started to make her mark uh, doing music for video games. Yeah. How did she do that? You know, I think that there is something, and this is something we do too, is being on social media understanding the trends you know like you know if she started off doing like i'm going to do celtic harp music that is something she does but it's not probably going to have a mass appeal and you'll see this all the time now is like there are things online that get you attention and then there's things online that you know make you money all right and those two things aren't always in alignment but you do need both you need to have both if you're going to utilize social media So with Melody, for example, her doing the Zelda theme on Harp and her kind of branding it with her image and the way she did it. Well, there are way more fans of Zelda than there are of ancient Celtic harp music, right? Now, what happens is they start in, that's like her first sort of lead magnet in many ways. It's like, come in for the video game music of Zelda or, you know, whatever else she's she's doing in that market around video games, because you could do that for any number of different franchises that are popular, right? And then you can also bring them in to be like, Hey, I also do this Celtic harp thing. And then some people wind up really enjoying the Celtic harp because one of the things you'll do if you follow Melody is that you'll see that, you know, Hey, this is a, you know, a a 500 year old, you know, harp uh, 
piece that I found and and it's beautiful and she does it and you're like oh that's really cool too but I came for the video games right and so you have to know like what are the trends in your market like like for us it, when when Dungeons and Dragons is releasing D and D one we do a D and D one episode about you know what they're talking about there just to ride the trend of that right like when AI was you know it's still a big thing AI is a huge part of you know some of our upcoming themes we're going to incorporate AI into you know how does that affect nerdpreneurs how does that affect you know uh how people interact uh you know on dating platforms which is actually something we did already we released an episode on ai wingman which is about having chat gpt as your wingman when talking to girls or or talking to guys by oh the way. my god so it, there, we did a whole episode on that oh, so <laughs> well there there but the thing is it's like there's there's things like that that we're we're riding the trends and so there's value in getting the attention but then you have to once they once you have someone's attention give them something they really want and need so that you can move them through to other things that potentially they might buy whether it be extended content like what we offer on Nerpreneur where we do extra interviews and bonus content and behind the scenes of how to make a podcast and how to build your audience all these things like that but also people will, uh, you know, but, but, or maybe it's, uh, you know, they get to buy your, your next Dungeons and Dragons book that you're releasing, or maybe they buy a ticket to your next live show, or they buy, you know, however you're going to monetize what you're doing, get the attention through writing trends because many things will be, there are memes in society. If you're aware of what they are, you can ride the trends of the memes and get attention and then build the bridge from that attention to your other thing where people actually buy and purchase something from you. Brilliant. And I like the fact that you're combining something. You're taking two totally different things and putting them together. And mm -hmm. you know, if you look in, at history, Gutenberg, when he uh, invented the printing press, did mm -hmm. just that. The yeah. ink from the wine making machine or the wine press and the 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 imaging, um, for, you know, from from printing and or not printing, but um, uh, what was it? It was like a stamping machine, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The oh, he, he said, okay, I can combine these, and now he that's how the printing press came to be. And then you can mass produce, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What, what's happened? Um, last question. Well, almost. What have you learned about yourself since you created this podcast? You know, I I learned a lot through launching various podcasts. And, you know, in the past, I had a podcast which was called You Rolled a One. It's still out there. But it, uh, it was an actual play where we played Dungeons and Dragons. And it was me. I always wanted to have a successful podcast. I always wanted to have the my own show, the ability to create something that was kind of mine. But it was myself and then four other people who were the cast. And it was great. The content was solid. However, when I was doing it, it was really me driven. It was a hundred percent me. Like I would set up the times we meet. I would do all the ad recording, editing. I would do all the production and, and sound effects and music. And then I would do all the marketing. And that was like, I was working with four other people, but I was pushing the boulder up a hill. And I realized fairly quickly, or I'm oh, sorry, maybe not too quickly. I did it for like two years almost. And I realized that they were never really going to get to the point of being as excited about what we were building as I was. And so being an entrepreneur is difficult at when you're, when you're even, even if you have a lot of resources or people helping you, when you have nobody helping you, nobody supporting you, it can be very, very difficult. And so I've learned, especially through Nerdpreneur, the balance of having a co-host with me, so I'm not doing all of this solo, and I've picked the right co-host that has a similar value system in terms of where we want to go, the ambition to get it done, and the, and the trust to execute and continue to do that. I have learned that that is some of the, the, the keys to success that I need is a partner in doing this. And by getting the right partner that I can go and bounce ideas off of and 
And I'll tell you, we have some episodes you'll hear where it's just us. We have we have interview episodes and then we have episodes where it's just Frank and I. And I love those Frank and I episodes because sometimes we're just talking about the podcast and where we're going. And sometimes we're he'll he'll balance me out on some of these things, right? Like, here's where I want to go. I'm very big picture. And he'll be like, okay, Chris, well, let's ground this in what we actually can do right now. Like, let's get and, and I'll get frustrated about getting to the success and he'll You're balance me out a little bit. He's the numbers. Yeah, yeah, very much. And, and it's great to have that conversation. Contrast. And also, like, I'll open up the uh, the interview, like I'll go out and sell people on being on our podcast, not that it takes much to sell them. I, it's awesome experience. And everyone who comes on wants to do it. But I'll just say that it's like, I'm the guy who opens up the doors, but I, it, you know, I can't tell you how many times I, I could drop the ball on like scheduling if I didn't hand it off to Frank. Frank is really good at like, okay, he's going to set all the times, make sure everybody's logistics are set up, send them the pre-show form, make sure they get into, you know, the places they need to so that we have a really great success. So he's kind of got a lot of those systemized things down. So I've really learned about myself is I play to my strengths. And you know what, if you can find the right partner, I mean, you don't have to be good at everything, but you should have somebody that ideally can balance you out and also work hard on the areas that you may not be that good at, you know, and you don't have to be good at everything to be successful, but you should always, always play to your strengths and do what you are best at so that you can spend the most time in your genius zones, I guess, if you want to call them that, where you can provide a lot of value and do more. I think that that's a, that's something that, I've really learned about myself. And also it's easy to be hard on yourself. You know, it's, and, and there, are, there are times in our journey where we want more than what we're getting. And it can be very easy for us to, to look at ourselves and beat ourselves up in order to get ourselves to move. And I talk with Frank a lot about, about this because I think sometimes the dynamic, he often is the kind that will beat himself up in order to make something happen. And uh, he won't mind me talking about that because we talk about it on our podcast. But I, I always, I have learned that it doesn't have to be, you know, make myself feel like crap in order to move. You can actually do it in a very kind way. And I've seen that with many of our nerdpreneurs. I've seen that with my own self, and I've seen it also with my co-host Frank, where when we bring ourselves a little bit of kindness and a little bit of patience. And we remind ourselves, you know, where we're going, why we're doing it. We don't, and that we get to do this, not that we have to do it, that we get to have this opportunity to talk with these people. We get to release an episode to our audience each month or each week. You know, we get to do these with that mindset shift of instead of I have to do it, I have to do it. And instead that this is all a gift, the ability for us to be more productive and happier through the process. You know, I know that that is what really works for me. And I encourage others to make the process as easy as they can for themselves so that they can enjoy that too. Yeah, so important. And and if you want a book to read about that process, um, Coach Dan Sullivan and Dr. Benjamin Hardy, uh, Gap in the Game. And mm. because a lot of entrepreneurs live in the gap, we're not good enough. I don't have enough money. I'm not where I want to be, right? Mm -hmm. It's not a very nice place to be. But if you look at your life and you go, okay, what have I accomplished in the past three months? Well, I've done this, 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 and this. It's like, yeah. well, that far outweighs the, the you know, the gain far outweighs, far outweighs the gap. So you're doing, you, you actually get to look and go, you know what? I'm better off than I thought, right? Because we're mm -hmm. always focused on, what we don't have, what we're not yet, or, you know, we haven't achieved that pinnacle, but whatever, just enjoy the journey, you know? Yeah. Well, be very, be very, be willing to look back on your progress. Mm. You know? I, I, I hear that from so many nerdpreneurs is that, cause they, cause this is just part of entrepreneurship is you're going to, you're going to have those days where you feel down or inadequate or whatever. And on those days, when these are questions that we ask them, it's like, what do you do when you get stuck? Right. Or when you have those down days, so many of them will say, you know, I look back on what I used to be like or what I used to do. And then I look at what I just did and how many more people are, say, reacting to what I do, how many more messages that I've received in terms of this. It, it feeds them to say, wow, look at my journey and how far I've come. And uh, I think that is so powerful to remind yourself, you know, that you didn't start off perfect and you're not perfect now. You just have to recognize the progress. Perfect doesn't exist and just keep making progress. Yep. 
You didn't you didn't start off walking. <laughs> no, exactly. And there, there's that old uh, it might be I think it's Jim Rohn who says it's like, you know, how long would you give a kid until you tell him to give up on walking? Yeah. And it's like, you know, no, no, no. You don't just like, oh, well, I guess they're never going to learn it. How many times would they need to fall for you to say, ah, just give up? No, you do it until. Yeah. Until they learn. Right. Yeah. And so if you're in that business, that's sort of the mentality you have to have. It's like learning how to walk. You have no skills in business. Well, you're going to learn them quicker by doing business than you will by sitting on the sidelines watching videos about business. OK, yeah. so uh, one of our people, Ameka, he uh, he uh credits uh i think grant cardone or gary vaynerchuk for this probably was gary but i think it was one of those things where he said look if you're scrolling and watching me right now just stop and get busy like you shouldn't even be doing this right now you should be out there hustling doing this thing that you're trying to do building your life building your business building your your uh your momentum and momentum is the most powerful force of business once you get out there it starts going you're going to start making progress you know scrolling is not momentum scrolling is wasting time scrolling is 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 a way to distract ourselves and so he actually stopped listening to anything online and immediately right after that video went off to work on his business and i'll leave that story for for when you listen to his actual episode because it is crazy what he was able to generate out of that first business um with uh the it was called uh the black nes guy <laughs> wow okay yeah. again we're out of time i i am so grateful to you um well, thank but, you I was, it's I a, i'm grateful to be on here this was so much fun yeah i, I had a good time too and i want to have you back to talk about um chat gpt oh know? yeah okay uh but where can we reach you again um and and connect of course with your work and and nerdpreneur and yeah yeah absolutely well for uh nerdpreneur you can find us on all podcast platforms that's uh, n-e-r-d preneur all right nerdpreneur and same on twitter or instagram or youtube or wherever you want to find us we are probably there at nerdpreneur pod or nerdpreneur podcast so uh you can also find me if you want to interact directly with me at professor epic productions you can check out my D, &D content there uh, i do have memes that i put out there i kind of do jokes and stuff and also i tend to put out any sort of music that i do i put out there as well uh, and that's where you'll find me and you're doing you know what i love about this you're doing your thing man you know you're doing your gift and you're you're doing your joy and because i think you would die you know going to work with uh you know a bank or yeah. whatever insurance company you know you, you would that was never on my on my 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 i don't begrudge people who love it like my mom yeah, is in the insurance sure. business yeah. she loves it but you know what i know for me like she she's wanted me to go into her business or take over her business for many years and i just knew from what i understand about it and who i know of myself that it wasn't where i wanted to be so pursue your passion you can make money doing it and, you know, continue to uh, to do the things you love doing and remain authentic because authenticity is what sells nowadays, not yes. anything else. No. So, and people can smell that, you know. Oh, exactly. Nerdpreneur, this is great. Um, thank you. Those listening, hearing us, I uh, hope you enjoyed 26 Minutes With and then our deeper dive. Uh, Love Chris, it. There's what a joy having you. And um, next week, we have uh, Barry Shanebaum, who's a very interesting man who's overcome uh, mental health uh, issues, Parkinson's. He's an artist. He's a troubadour. He's a musician. Uh, definitely a, a very interesting uh, human being. I love him. And uh, that's our guest next week. Have a great week, everybody. Stay well. Keep leading. <laughs>